Today, I'm going to continue to cover some early responses to deism, and especially some that focus on the relationship of faith and reason. All right, I want to start with the Puritan Richard Baxter. This picture of him is a rather austere picture, and he had a rather austere life. He was a great Puritan author, one of the greatest theologians among the Puritans, um, and from the time of the restoration of the Stuart monarchy with Charles II after the collapse of Cromwell's protectorate, Baxter had a difficult life, and indeed near the end of his life in uh, 1685 when he was nearly 70 years old, he was actually imprisoned for a year and a half, um, probably on a, a very thin pretense. There was no real idea that he was actually reacting against the crown. He was simply what he was, not a, uh, not a supporter of the Restoration. Uh, lived through the Glorious Revolution. When the Glorious Revolution took place, uh, he was fairly rapidly restored uh, and was able to live out the last few years of his life in relative peace. In 1667, he published a book called The Reasons of the Christian Religion. He tells us in that book that he wrote it first for his personal satisfaction and only later decided to make it public. Samuel Clark's work, A Discourse Concerning the Being and Attributes of God, which was one of the early Boyle lectures, does not mention Baxter, but some later writers have said that if you compare what Baxter wrote in 1667 to what Clark wrote in uh, 1704, I think is the edition I'm thinking of anyway, you'll find that Clark depends rather heavily on Baxter, not only for arguments, but even the order in which he presents his material. So there's a possible pattern match between Baxter's work and the work of Samuel Clark. If some of you are interested in pursuing that, that would be something to look up, and you can raise questions in the forum, and I will try to give you some further pointers if you're interested. In 1671, he wrote and then added to editions of Reasons of the Christian Religion, something called More Reasons for the Christian Religion, and I've given you uh, a place to go look for that in the readings outline for the course, so you can go and you can have a look at that if you're interested. The quotations I'm about to give are largely from the first named work, The Reasons of the Christian Religion, and I want to lay these out in some detail. That means quoting Baxter at length, because Baxter is articulating a certain line common to Englishmen of the time about the relation of faith to reason, and because that is going to be attacked uh, as a weakness in Christianity. It's useful to see that Baxter is laying this out very clearly and at length in something published before most of the deists that we're going to be looking at. So for that reason, I'm going to give uh, quite extensive quotations from the Puritan Richard Baxter. Baxter maintains that all that is required for salvation is sincere repentance and faith. The nature of that faith is something that we'll have a look at in a moment. Uh, atonement is available to all. This is contra the uh, Synod of Dort and the Tenets of Calvinism. The atonement is not limited. It is unlimited. That doesn't mean universal salvation. It means the availability of salvation to anyone who will repent and trust in faith. He holds to what would later be called a Christus Victor interpretation of the atonement as opposed to the Anselmian interpretation more common in Calvinist circles. So although he was a Puritan, he was not a Calvinist. And it's important to remember that not all Puritans were Calvinists. Faith, he says, is best and most safely grounded on evidence. And the appeal instead to the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit is dangerous. He actually uses a cognate of that word. He says they believe dangerously who make this something that's entirely an appeal to the witness of the Spirit. Uh, some of you familiar with Alvin Plantinga's Reformed epistemology may recognize the move to an appeal to direct personal knowledge brought home to one's heart by the work of the Holy Spirit. Baxter is not a fan of that approach, which was old even in his time. Here's an extensive quotation from Baxter pertaining to this. Uh, I'm going to read this, and then at the end of it, I'll give you a link to a place where you can go and see the whole thing in its context. I say, says Baxter, to affirm that the scriptures cannot be known to be God's word 
without such a testimony of the Spirit as some of these, is, in my judgment, a justifying men in their infidelity, and a telling them that there is not yet extant any sufficient evidence of Scripture truth till the Spirit create it in ourselves and with all, to leave it impossible to produce any evidence for the conviction of an unbeliever who cannot know the testimony of the Spirit in me. And, indeed, it is direct expectation of enthusiasm, and that is ordinary to every Christian. In other words, to expect a direct revelation is to give people an excuse for unbelief who don't have it. That is not a safe way to proceed. To bolster his position, Baxter then goes on to quote some of the work of Richard Hooker, who was a great um, 16th century divine who worked out the laws of ecclesiastical polity for the Church of England. So as he moves on here, he's going to quote Hooker extensively, showing that he's not alone in these sentiments. So we'll get to that here. Uh, but again, to tell an infidel that it is principium indemonstrable, an indemonstrable principle, just something you have to start with, that scripture is God's word and that it is to be believed and not to be proved as if the very revelation that this is the word of God and not only the thing testified that this is true, were not an object of science, but rather pure faith. This might sooner harden infidels than convince them. Sure I am that both Christ and his apostles used sufficient in its own way and convincing arguments to persuade men to believe and dealt with men as rational creatures. Uh, that last line, and dealt with men as rational creatures. If you're taking notes, make a note that this will come up again in the sermons of Philip Doddridge, D-O-D-D-R-I-D-G-E. Philip Doddridge has a sermon in which he expressly appeals to the rational element in his hearers. He says, I speak to you as to rational creatures, judge of the reasonableness of what I say. So Baxter may be influencing Doddridge there, although Doddridge does not name Baxter. Truly, saith Hooker, it is not a thing impossible nor greatly hard, even by such kinds of proofs, so to manifest and clear that point, that is, to make the point clear, to take away all objection to it, that no man living shall be able to deny it without denying some apparent principle, such as all men acknowledge to be true. And scripture teaches us that saving truth, which God hath discovered to the world by revelation, but it presumeth us taught otherwise that itself is divine and sacred. In other words, yes, scripture teaches us saving truths, but we must first learn by some other means that scripture is itself divine and sacred. And these things we believe, knowing by reason that scripture is the word of God. Notice the role of reason there in authenticating the document to which one appeals. Again, saith he, and he quotes Hooker again, it is not required nor can be exacted at our hands that we should yield any other assent than such as doth answer the evidence. Again, how bold and confident soever we may be in words when it comes to the trial, such as the evidence is which the truth hath, such as the assent. Nor can it be stronger if grounded as it should be. So those are quotations from Hooker, and I would draw your attention to something that those of you who have studied the history of philosophy will recognize. John Locke, and following Locke, Hume, will endorse a principle that the degree of our assent to a proposition should be proportionate to the evidence. Baxter, before either Locke or Hume, is articulating that principle and quoting Hooker from the 1500s to justify himself in, in this. So this is not something that was a new response. It's not something that was invented in order to respond to the deists. Instead, this is something that was already part of the fabric of English thought and is being brought to bear on the question of the relation of faith to reason. Uh, but it is not be, it's not some place that they're backing up to as a response to the deists. This rational strain, rationalistic, uh, theological rationalism, some will call it, is something that is a firm part of the English tradition already. Note that phrase, if grounded as it should be. That's a very interesting phrase. 
in Hooker. What happens if it's not grounded as it should be? Well, Baxter goes on in his own voice. Is not faith a rational act of a rational creature, and so the understanding proceeds discursively in its production? And is not that the strongest faith, which hath the strongest reasons to prove the testimony to be valid upon which it resteth, and the clearest apprehension and use of those reasons, and the truest faith, which hath the truest reasons truly apprehended and used? And must not that, on the contrary, be weak or false faith, which receives the verity and validity of the testimony from weak or false grounds, though the testimony of itself be the truest in the world. Reason does not all by itself give us the articles of faith, according to Baxter, but reason does authenticate the grounds of that. It tells us that we may rationally trust in these scriptures, and for that reason, these are rational things to believe, not because we are immediately inspired, but because reason tells us that these are things that may be trusted. Our divines used to say concerning love to Christ that it is not to be measured by the degree of fervor so much as by the grounds and motives, so that if a man should love Christ upon the same reason as the Turk loves Muhammad, if it were it were no true love, if he love him upon false grounds, it must needs be false love, and if upon common grounds, it can be but a common love. I will not conclude that to believe in Jesus Christ upon the grounds that a Turk believes in Muhammad, or to believe scripture upon the same reasons that the Turks believe the Al-Quran is no true faith, supposing that both have the like verity of their reasons, but at best it must be more weak and doubtful. Again, this is direct quotation from Baxter. Those of you who are familiar with the work of the New Atheists, think about the common line of argument that if you had been born in Saudi Arabia, you would be a Muslim. Here, Baxter is explicitly addressing the kind of belief that arises solely from the way that one has been raised and says that is at best very weak and doubtful. And then finally, a kind of sad challenge. Are the generality of Christians able to give any better than some such common reason to prove the verity of scripture? Nay, are the more exercised understanding sorts of Christians able by sound arguments to make it good if an enemy or a temptation put them to it? Nay, are the meaner sort of ministers in England able to do this? Let them that have tried judge. There's a passage in the work of William Wilberforce, uh, who was a reformer and ardently argued against the slave trade, ultimately got uh, bills passed in Parliament abolishing the slave trade in England. Wilberforce was uh, also concerned with Christian education, and he has a passage that could have been inspired by this passage of Baxter. He doesn't quote Baxter, but the resemblance between the two is striking. I've gone on at length about Baxter because I think he provides an interesting backdrop for us to consider the work of John Toland. Toland um, was a f an acquaintance of John Locke, and because of his uh, relationship to John Locke, sometimes Locke was accused of having been an aider and a better of English deism. Uh, Toland and also Anthony Collins, whom we'll be reading next week. So it's important to say right up front that the acquaintance was not a deep personal friendship, and once Toland published his work, Locke publicly distanced himself from him. There's a work by Samuel Heffelbauer called The Relation of Locke to English Deism that is fairly thorough and exonerates Locke of any contribution to English Deism. Uh, Toland was born in Ireland, and as you might expect from that, he was raised Roman Catholic. But in his adolescence, he became a dissenter, and so aligned himself not even with the Church of England, but with the more radical Protestants of his time. Later, he drifted into deism, and at the end of his life, in a work called the Pantheisticon, uh, actually embraced a form of pantheism that drew its inspiration from Spinoza.
the work that we're most concerned with here is his work Christianity Not Mysterious. This was published in 1696 and sold briskly. Uh, I think it was up to a third edition by the next year. And it was burned and the author was ordered to be arrested by the British Parliament. He skipped town and was not in fact arrested, but I think he fled uh, several places, Holland among them. And when he did that, Locke distanced himself publicly from Toland. He also wrote a couple of years later a couple of works, one A Life of John Milton and then another work called Amintor. In this he argues that our present Gospels were selected from among a wide array of equally authentic works of the Apostles and their companions and this provoked a number of works on the canon of the New Testament. Uh, some of those by Jones and even a, a brief response by Samuel Clark are discussed briefly in Leland's view of the principal deistical writers. So you should have read that about Amintor. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about Amintor because that subject I think is fairly easily uh, and ably addressed by the people cited by Leland. The main point to see here is that from Thomas Jefferson through Richard Dawkins, you once again have people saying, well, the uh, people who selected the Gospels did so capriciously, they did so in view of the party of, that they favored, the party in power, and so forth. So have a look uh, at some of those responses if you're interested in seeing how this particular debate might have applicability to contemporary discussions. But Christianity Not Mysterious is a more extensive work. Here are some of the things that Toland claims in that. He takes this epigraph from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Tillotson, who was uh, a man of latitude, as the phrase went, um, willing to cooperate with Christians from outside of the Anglican Church, though remaining a staunch Anglican himself. Here he quotes this line from Tillotson, although he's going to mean it in a sense where Tillotson would not have taken it. He says, we need not desire a better evidence that any man is in the wrong than to hear him declare against reason, and thereby to acknowledge that reason is against him. Okay, what does it mean to be against reason? Well, there was a distinction common at the time, and Toland discusses it, between things that are above reason and things that are contrary to reason. Things that are contrary to reason contradict manifest truths, possibly even contradict themselves. Those things, some people were willing to embrace anyway, but m many others would not. You can't imagine Baxter embracing something that's contradictory to something manifestly clear to reason. What does it mean for things to be above reason? Well, there are a couple of definitions circulating, and we have to be careful when any author uses the phrase. One meaning of it is that it is something that we cannot understand. That is the thing, the meaning, that Toland wants to make use of. But another meaning of it is something that we could not have discovered by unaided reason alone. If reason working on its own could not have shown to us this truth, then it may be said to be above reason. We needed something else. We needed a revelation, perhaps, to show it to us. But once it's shown to us, we can understand as well as we need to what it means. So those two different meanings of what it is for something to be above reason uh, get shifted between, back and forth. So be careful as you're reading to make sense of which way these things are being taken. Here's what Toland has to say, taking it in the sense of something unintelligible, to say of something we cannot understand that it is merely above reason, but not contrary to it, is of no use. We cannot believe a mystery, that is, something we cannot understand. Now Toland is very good at picking from the works of the Christians he wants to criticize. Uh, so he's very selective in his quotations. And he does find some people who say some really astonishing things in this vein. Let's have some quotations. Uh, first of all, from Christianity Not Mysterious, I hold nothing as an article of my religion but what the highest evidence forced me to embrace. Sounds good as far as it goes. But he writes against the view, which he attributes to some of the fathers of the church, that we must adore what we cannot comprehend. And he says, understandably enough, that he doesn't know what that means. What would it mean to adore what you cannot comprehend? 
Um, interestingly, unlike Herbert and Blount, who said, hey, there's a natural religion, we can tell you what it consists in, that there's one God, that he is to be worshipped, um, that he will forgive us of our sins if we repent. Tolent doesn't hold that there's some universal religion that's instinctive in every man. He self-consciously follows Locke's theory of knowledge, and those of you who remember the first book of Locke's essay concerning human understanding will remember that Locke spends quite a bit of time arguing that there are no innate ideas. There are no ideas that we are simply born with. Everything comes through sensation. Locke is a concept empiricist. He holds we don't even have any concepts except those that arise from sensation. In this, Locke is followed by Hume, of course. Now, there's a possible relation here that I have not seen explored between Toland's claim that there is not a universal religious instinct and Locke's rejection of innate ideas. So if you're interested in that question, this might be a place to go do a little digging around, reading in Toland, reading in Locke, and seeing if you can find a more extensive connection. Some quotations. Those who stick not to say that they could believe a downright contradiction to reason did they find it contained in the scripture, do justify all absurdities whatsoever, and by opposing one light to another, undeniably make God the author of all incertitude. For the proof of the divinity of scripture depending upon reason, if the clear light of the one might be any way contradicted, how shall we be convinced of the infallibility of the other? You're sawing off the branch you're sitting on. You can't appeal to something that is justified by reason and then say that if that thing tells you to disbelieve reason, you will follow and disbelieve reason. Clear contradictions. How crazy is that? Anyone who says this is really walking himself backward into a self-refuting kind of position. Now, in light of that, I want to talk about something that John Locke wrote. In 1690, he wrote his essay concerning human understanding. That's a major work, and we'll look at a quotation from that. But in 1695, he published a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. The interesting thing for our purpose is that although Toland's Christianity Not Mysterious was not published until 1696, Locke had read manuscript of it two years earlier. And so some of the things that Locke has to say at the end of The Reasonableness of Christianity are actually connected to some of the things that Toland says as well as to some of the things Herbert says. It was only recently discovered by looking over Locke's handwritten papers that he had had this access to a manuscript of Toland. So this is something that older writers are not going to tell you, and that's why most older writers, Leland among them, talk merely of Locke's connection to Herbert and his response to Herbert. But actually, uh, there's evidence that he's writing with Toland in mind as well. Here's a quotation from his essay concerning human understanding. This is addressed against the enthusiasts who wanted private revelation to be the standard of religious truth. Reason is natural revelation whereby the eternal father of light and fountain of all knowledge communicates to mankind that portion of truth which he has laid within the reach of their natural faculties. Revelation is natural reason enlarged by a new set of discoveries communicated by God immediately, which reason vouches the truth of by the testimony and proofs it gives that they come from God, so that he that takes away reason to make way for revelation puts out the light of both, and does much what the same as if he would persuade a man to put out his eyes, the better to receive the remote light of an invisible star by a telescope. Locke does not quote Baxter here, but the similarity in their thought is very obvious. You have reason vouching for the truth of revelation by the testimony and proofs it gives that these new discoveries come from God. So reason judges the credentials of a revelation. There's a point here that came up in Blount that we will need to be thinking of because it'll recur throughout these discussions. If we have 
a certain amount of evidence, say, apparent miracles, that something comes from God. And yet, as we look at it, it appears to be, in some deep sense, unworthy, maybe morally unworthy of God. Should our worries about the content of the supposed revelation make us doubt that it really is a revelation from God, despite the fact that we have a certain amount of putative evidence in its favor? The question of the content and of our judgment of the content is one where Christian authors disagreed with one another. Some of them said, well, of course, we take the content into account as well. And others said, we are fit judges of the credentials of a revelation, but we are not fit judges of its content. So if the credentials are good, we have to believe the content, even if it seems to be morally objectionable. That divide among the religious defenders in their responses to the deists is something that we still see being played out today with respect, for example, to morally problematic passages in the Old Testament, as in the book of Joshua, where there are apparently wholesale slaughters that go on. Some people will try to offer a defense that mitigates the moral enormity of what's narrated, and others will simply say, it's in Scripture, Scripture's from God, you have to accept that this was all right, even if it offends your moral sensibilities. So that dichotomy is one that we're going to see coming up over and over. Locke tells us that he's on the side of those who want reason to vouch for the truth of these revelations by the testimony and proof it gives that they come from God, but then the question is, does that include internal evidence? That tension is one that will come up over and over. Well then, what is required? for someone to be a Christian. Locke says, all Christianity requires is an acknowledgement that Jesus is the Messiah and repentance. Now, compare this to what Baxter said, right? Repentance and faith are required, but what is it that counts as faith? Locke takes a great deal of time, a couple hundred pages, laying out an extended argument that from one end of scripture to the other, the thing that is required is the acknowledgement that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one who was to come, spoken of by the prophets of the Old Testament. What Locke does not say is that one is required to believe in the deity of Christ. And the fact that he does not say that offended some people like Jonathan Edwards, who maintained that this was really a sneaky, secret attempt to smuggle Unitarianism in under the guise of piety and faithfulness to scripture. So Locke was engaged in a long-running debate with some people, Edwards among them, trying to argue that he is not endorsing Unitarianism by saying this. So the defenses of the reasonableness of Christianity, the defense and the second defense, are uh, addressed to those kinds of critics in part. Well, a common objection. What about those who have never heard of Jesus? Um, Locke says, God will require of every man according to what he hath, and not according to what he hath not. He will not expect ten talents where he gave but one, nor require any one should believe a promise of which he has never heard. And then he goes on and quotes the passage from Romans 2 about being judged according to the light you've been given. So Locke takes a somewhat open view, a somewhat inclusive view uh, yes, the death of Christ is necessary for our salvation, but those who have never heard it will deal with God directly, and God will be merciful to those who have no opportunity of knowing. Notice again how non-Calvinistic this is, uh, that sort of rejection of the stronger forms of Calvinism is characteristic of the latitudinarians, um, among whom Locke might be classed, although he's not usually thought of as a major theologian. Um, briefly, a Scottish dissenter in here, Thomas Halliburton, he's interesting to us because he actually published his major work uh, in 1714, that is, posthumously. He had completed it and it was published after his death, but it's a response in large measure to people like Blount and Herbert. Halliburton gives us the first account of the history of deism in England 
And Leslie refers to this very briefly at the beginning of his first letter, or sorry, not Leslie, Leland, at the beginning of his first letter. So if you were reading that, you'll have seen a reference to Halliburton. Halliburton's views are interesting and in some ways uh, even a little unsettling. First, he says atheism is out and other religions like Islam are manifestly fraudulent. So the choice is between Christianity and deism. Nothing else can do. Deism, however, is both false and ruining. It will tend to a man's personal moral undoing. Uh, he speaks of the case of uh, Vanini, who was executed for his atheism, and he, he speaks of it approvingly. He says, yes, this he was justly killed. Um, that is pretty wild. Um, Vanini did intend to go about spreading atheism, but he was fairly brutally killed, had his tongue ripped out, was strangled, and then burned at the stake. Um, so Halliburton's endorsement of that bespeaks a time when people took very seriously the idea that these were capital crimes. A little less gruesomely, he says the knowledge of God required for salvation goes beyond the knowledge of something as the greatest of all beings. You can, by the means of natural theology, perhaps, attain to the idea that there is some greatest of all beings. Maybe a cosmological or an ontological argument can give you that. But you need more particular knowledge than that in order to worship God as he ought to be worshipped. And the only way to gain that knowledge is by revelation. So the deists who say, you know, all that you need to know, apart from any revelation, is just directly known, they're simply wrong. And Halliburton takes quite a bit of time trying to argue that that kind of specific knowledge is simply not available. Charles Leslie, the Anglican non-juror, we already have read some of his work, but let's discuss him briefly. Um, at the Glorious Revolution, he was asked to renounce his oaths in favor of the Stuart monarchs, Charles II and James, in favor of William and Mary. And he held, as one can have some sympathy with this view, that if you hold your oath to mean something, you cannot simply abandon it. You have to stay with the oath. You can't change it when somebody new comes into power. And as a result, he was deprived of his living, his livelihood, uh, and thereafter was dependent upon the charity of those to whom he ministered. Um, Leslie is a what we might call a Christian rationalist, and he says this very explicitly. This is not in his short and easy method, so I've given you a link to this from his tract on authority and private judgment. He says, I received the scriptures upon the testimony, not authority, of the church. And I examine that testimony as I do other facts till I have satisfied my private judgment. There is no other way. That phrase, private judgment, is a theological term of art. It was specifically against private judgment that many of the Counter-Reformation Catholics argued. Their idea was that you need the church to do the judging for you. You cannot make these decisions yourself. Some high Anglicans followed them in that, although the mainstream of 17th century Anglican thought was more in line with Leslie's view here. Most notably, he's clearly endorsing the position that Baxter held, that, and that indeed Hooker held, that these things are vouched for in the ordinary way. We receive the scriptures, but we don't do so blindly, and we don't do so merely from authority. We do it after weighing the testimony in their favor. Some of that testimony does come from the fathers of the church, but we don't accept it as being true simply on their authority. We check to see whether it holds up to examination. We looked in our readings at Leslie's four rules. Here they are again, uh, very briefly, that the event is such is the sort of thing that men can judge with their senses, their eyes and ears, that it is something that happened in public, that it is commemorated by some kind of public monument or outward action that is still continued to this day, and that these monuments or actions were made or instituted at the time when the event happened. The first two of these rules regard the senses 
and the public nature of the alleged events. They ensure that the original witnesses were not deceived. If it's something that your senses can judge, and if it's public, then in good faith, those who believed it at first could not be said to be mistaken. The last two rules regarding the acts or monuments and their institution at the time of the events alleged to have occurred, these ensure that those who received the testimony were not deceived by it. So if you receive it later at the end of a chain of testimony, this is how you can know. How do you know that the Declaration of Independence was signed? Well, it's because we celebrate the 4th of July. The 4th of July is a holiday, and you all know that it's an American holiday. If you've lived in America, you can't get around it. You hear fireworks going off, and it's been celebrated ages upon ages back, all the way back to 1776. So the Declaration of Independence is vouched for as a historical event by the celebration by Americans of that day ever since. The gunpowder plot is remembered in England because Guy Fawkes Day is celebrated when they burn the Catholic terrorist in effigy, remembering the attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament with gunpowder. If you want to remember the four rules, you can take the terms I've marked in gold there and rearrange them to spell the word past, which is a handy little mnemonic for recalling the four rules that Leslie lays, lays out. Some of you were discussing the question of the nature of the inference here. Leslie presents it as an argument that licenses your inference and indeed sometimes uses language of certainty so that if something meets these four marks then you can be certain of it. And this raises an interesting question that we tend to slide past in an introductory undergraduate logic course. In a logic course we learn to do inferences of the form if P then Q, P therefore Q. And we say that this is a valid inference because if the premises are true then the conclusion must also be true. That's fine. But what if we are to some extent uncertain about our premises? How is our uncertainty transferred into uncertainty about the conclusion? Well, it turns out that there is a fairly simple rule governing this, and that is that you take the probability of the premises and you subtract the, each probability from one. So suppose that I'm certain that if P then Q, but only 90% sure that P is true. Then I'm 10% uncertain about that second premise. And my conclusion that Q can be said to be at least 90% certain, or possibly more. So it has a lower bound of 90%. If my premises had probabilities of 90% and 80%, that would be 30% total uncertainty. So my conclusion would be at least 70% sure and possibly more. Leslie doesn't deal with that. He's not a logician, but if we think that his argument is deductively legitimate, then uncertainty, say, about premise number four here would be something that would transfer down to our setting of a lower bound on the probability of the conclusion. Those of you who study probability theory may be interested in that and might be interested in questions of how we should take Leslie's argument, how we should interpret it. There's more to be said there, but it gets technical, so I'm going to avoid it for the purposes of this class, but I know some of you do have that interest. Okay, that ends the portion here.